Lewandowski's been picked out. Socks down to his ankle. Picks out Stansfield! That's the hat trick! And that's what dreams are made of! Hello and welcome to Park Life, the official Exeter City podcast. Things just keep getting better, don't they? Three fantastic results in the last few weeks, and we've even had a bit of time for some rest ahead of Charlton on Friday. Plenty to get through, so let's get straight into it. Coming up in today's show, I'm joined by BBC Radio Devon commentator Dr Alan Tong to talk about City's recent successes, as well as his own after the launch of his brand new book. City defender Jack Fitzwater also pops in ahead of the match on Friday before Joe Puddifoot from Charlton Live gives us the lowdown on the addicts. First up, Alan Tong joins me to preview City's game against Charlton on Friday. Alan, welcome to Park Life. Thanks for joining us once again. Firstly, massive congratulations on the release of your new book, From Red to Red. It's a great read <laughs> and we'll come back to it a little later in the episode. But let's kick things off with a little bit of City chat. Um, it's been a tough season for City, full of ups and downs, but finally things are starting to look a little bit more positive at St. James Park. How impressed have you been with the side over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Uh, good to see you again. Um, I think the last time I spoke to you and came on to Park Life, I think we were in a, a little bit of despair at the time. I think, <laughs> I, think was going, I think was heading into the Lincoln City game at home and I think we were looking at something like we've not won for about six or seven games. Or <laughs> about that, yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad to be joining you now to sort of say, well, it's a look, looking a lot more optimistic now and, you know, the, the, the team has done really well. Um, we had a nice little period of form and picked up some cracking results. Uh, as you say, so I've been lucky lucky enough to see some of those wins. Uh, Barnsley away was fantastic. Wigan Athletic away was fantastic. Um, and then, as you say, some over this last sort of week, as well, managed to sort of pick up a point, all of seven points, where, you know, we went to the sort of top of the table side, Bolton, and, you know, they came down to St. James's and we, we managed to, well, lucky, nearly beat them, you know, and equalise late on. So that was unfortunate. And then in the week, I was at Shrewsbury Town for that game, which was fantastic. Um, you know, picked up a fantastic three points there because, you know, I think under a bit of pressure there because they were both sort of similar positions in the table. And then, you know, going into the sort of last weekend, managing to get three points against Burton, that's that's kind of pushed us up to a position of nearly safety, but just not quite yet. I mean, it's it's pretty close, isn't it? I think 47 points at the moment. You think that maybe you know, three or four more and, and you probably see that, that safety is secured. It's been brilliant, really. I mean, those recent results, uh, three unbeaten now, including the draw against Bolton, which you mentioned, and then also those victories over Shrewsbury and Burton. Great wins and brilliant to pick up all those points. But I think more importantly, almost three fantastic performances as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think what was quite encouraging is that the squad's looking a lot better now, a lot stronger than, you know, Plenty of options off the bench if needed. And, you know, I thought just just going back to that, just to touch on that Shrewsbury game, I think that was one of the funny one, really, because um, I think they had a player sent off really early. And, um, you know, for quite a large chunk of that game, it, they, they pose exit to a sort of a different problem, i.e. we're going to just sit behind the ball now and almost like, you've got to break us down. And, you know, what I was particularly um, uh, enjoyed about that was, you know, Exeter just probed and they kept the ball really well. I think the possession stats were insane at one stage, like 84% like possession. But I think I mentioned on Radio Devon, it's got to be possession with a purpose. We've got to score. And I think when once that first goal went in from Will Ames, a great little flick off the corner. And then, you know, we managed to find it too. And I think Luke Harris got his first goal, which was fantastic. And then a brilliant finish from Jack Aitchison as well. They made one off, in off the post with his left peg. Um, and that, you know, a really good three points there. And it could have been a lot more, I think, you know, we had a few good chances in the second half and I think it's always difficult playing against 10 men, but, you know, to find that victory and then go on to Saturday and beat Burton as well, you know, that, that puts us in like a, a much stronger position now to to uh, to keep our safety in League One. Yeah, exactly that. And turning that possession into goals is something that we've we maybe struggled with at the start of the season. You saw us with these huge possession stats, but the goal scoring just wasn't there. So it's great to see that that that's come about. I guess each of those games, Bolton, uh, Burton and, and Shrewsbury, of course, in the week, 
they all posed a different challenge. Against Bolton, it was coming back against one of the best teams in the league. Shrewsbury taking advantage against those 10 men. And then Burton, we had to defend our lead with a man uh, down. And, and that was always going to be difficult. But we came through on each of those occasions. I guess that says quite a lot about the resilience of the team as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's a great point, Tom. I think that, you know, I always say that, you know, a, a good side, a good squad is one that can win football matches in different ways. And uh, as you said there, you know, we had to, to come back from behind against Bolton and uh, absolutely over the moon to see Sonny Cox chipping in with a couple of really well-taken goals. That was fantastic. And in front of the big bank as well, which was amazing. Uh, you know, obviously, we spoke about the, you know, the 10-men situation of Shrewsbury. And then, and like you say, just probing and, and just getting the win against Burton was fantastic as well. And, and as you correctly say, you know, all three results there have been found in a, in a slightly different manner. Yeah, and you mentioned Sonny Cox. We've got to talk about him and we've waxed lyrical about him on, on Park Life very recently. But he's been fantastic. I mean, those two goals against Bolton just proved that he was a player that's ready to start at this kind of level, capable of leading the line in League One. Just how impressed have you been with Sonny? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's like I think, you know, Exeter brilliant on some of the youth development that they've had over the last few seasons, Tom. You know, they brought some really good players through into the first team and you know, one thing that Exeter do particularly well is they, you know, they think about the loan situation and, you know, just, just to bring these players on a little bit and, you know, get them used to the physicalities of professional football. And with that patience and, you know, when your chance comes, all you have to do is try and take it. And, you know, when, when Sonny's chance has come, he always chips in with a few goals now, which is amazing. And he's managed to sign a new contract, which is fantastic. So, um, you know, fingers crossed for the Grecian fans, you know, the future's looking very bright for Sonny. You know, hopefully to, to go and score loads of goals for us. Yeah, well, exactly that. Um, since the Burton game, though, we've had a little bit of a break. And as a club, we're still relatively new to this international break business. Um, but it's created a, a decent gap between our last game against Burton and our next on Friday against Charlton. Do you feel, though, that that break kind of came at a bit of a frustrating time considering the form that we were on? Yeah, maybe, but we've we've played a lot of football, Tom, haven't we? As well, you know, we've had like plenty of weeks where we've been playing sort of like Saturdays, midweek Saturdays. So, you know, maybe the players are absolutely you know over the moon just to grab a, a bit of a breather. Some of them. So, um, yeah, I was just listening to. I thought uh, one of my old teammates, Big Kev Miller. I was listening to his interview last week in relation to you know talking about the remaining games of the season, and I thought he came up with a fantastic point, as in. You know, we're just going to maybe try and beat, win as many as we can and maybe try and beat last season's points all as an objective now. I think, you know, it's difficult sometimes when you get to a certain amount of points to think, well, what are we playing for, really? We don't we don't want to really go into comfort zones, but, you know, try and avoid that complacency. But if we can maybe fix our sights on the 56 points from last season and maybe try and get above that in our remaining seven games, I think that's a, a really good uh, objective to aim for. Yeah, it certainly is. And, you know, you can't underestimate the, the the challenge that it was always going to be to stay in League One for a second successive season. You talk about second season syndrome a lot. And um, hopefully, if we pick up uh, enough points over the last few games, um, then we'll secure our League One status for another year. But to do that, we've got to win maybe a couple more. And the next challenge, I guess, is Charlton Athletic. A big club, of course, formerly in the Premier League. They haven't had a great season, but recently, under Nathan Jones, who they appointed in the last few games, they've improved drastically. Currently eight games unbeaten. What are you expecting from them on Friday? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be a tough game. It'd be an interesting one, this one, Tom, because obviously we have Charlton and we go to Charlton, don't we, on Easter Monday. So, you know, let's let's hope it's a really good Easter for the Grecians where we can maybe get th three points out of six or four points out of six, you know, just to get us that 50-point mark and then see what we can do uh, with the rest of the game. So, you know, to take us to the end of the season. But as you say, it's, it's not easy. As Chelsea, a reasonably big club, you know, they're going to pose different challenges, you know, some some decent lads in there and just, just behind us in the table at the moment, aren't they? So... You know, if we can maybe win that Sat uh, Friday and then, you know, get ahead of, of Charlton a little bit and just get to that 50 point mark, I think that would be a, a fantastic job done. But um, uh, yeah, as you say, we're in a good run of form at the moment. Just to keep that going, it'll be, it'll be really good. Yeah, one player who's been a mainstay in City's defence this season has been Zach Jules. We'll be without him on Friday as he's serving his ban. How, how do you think the defence will cope without Zach in, in that back three? Because he's been brilliant this season. 
Yeah, I think the good thing now, Tom, is we've got we've got sort of you know, solidity kind of there, haven't we? In a, in a way where you know our Pierre Sweeney, like experienced head, and he can come in and just you know, keep keep the back three to, together, and then you know Will Aimson around him, and um, you know maybe Chet Diabate might come in, and 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 somebody maybe just a bit on the fringes, Alex Hartridge just been on the fringes in the last sort of like few weeks, but you know we have got cover there, which is great. So there are options, but as you say, so I think he's had a good season, Zach, hasn't he? And uh, he's done really well, looked impressive, a strong player, you know, really good left foot on him. And, you know, he's he's been commanded in that kind of back three that exited play. So that may be a bit of a blow, but hopefully, you know, the manager got a bit of cover there to bring in and, and sort that out. Yeah, well, let's hope so. It's going to be a great occasion at the park, expecting a sellout, which is always exciting. Are you feeling confident that the boys can deliver a good performance on Good Friday? I hope so, Tom. We're, we're in good form, aren't we? That's the main thing. We're, we're coming in as the form team, as you say, Charlton have having a good bit of form as well, of course. But you know, let's let's hope the big bank will be roaring and get behind the lads. And you know, let's this this remaining seven games of the season. Let's let's see how many points we can pick up and you know establish ourselves in in League One, and then uh, you know we can kind of put that behind us and start the planning then for next season. Perfect. Well, Alan, thanks so much for your insight. We'll be back a little later in the episode to talk about your brand new book, From Red to Red, uh, the story of Fergie's first fledgling. So we'll see you in a little bit. Next, I'm joined by City defender Jack Fitzwater to talk about fighting his way back into contention. Jack, welcome to Park Life. Thanks so much for coming on. I think it's fair to say that you've had a bit of a tricky experience since joining Exeter City back in September. Those first couple of months saw you play fairly regularly, uh, but then you started falling out the side. Just talk to me a little bit about your journey with Exeter City so far. Yeah, it's one that's been a bit of a stop-start journey so far, but it's one that I've actually really enjoyed. The people, the club, the playing staff, the coaching staff, everyone around the club's been really, really good with me. And um, yeah, it's been one of them where I was, as you say, I was playing, I was getting a bit of a run of games. Felt like I was playing quite well. And then it just ha- so happened, I kind of damaged my foot against Middlesbrough in the cup. And then I was trying to do loads of different things with injections and playing through training and stuff to try and get back, which then I went and got a second opinion uh, through the club and they said I needed an operation. So that knocked me back. I think I was out until then late January, early Feb. And then since then, I've been working like really, really hard to get myself up to a level uh, where I'm ready to be uh, picked in the squad again. Well, that'll be music to every ex to City fans is, I'm sure. Um, but I can imagine, though, that not being in the matchday squad can be pretty difficult. From what I can see, though, it doesn't look like that that's damaged your relationship with your teammates. I know just last week you travelled up to Cardiff with a few of the lads to watch Will and Immy play for Finland. I guess that says quite a lot about the group of players that we've got at the club and the togetherness of the group. Yeah, definitely. You can tell as well. I think it all stems from, obviously, we went on a real bad run um, and we lost quite a few games. We couldn't get a win and there wasn't any kind of like moaning wasn't any blame. There wasn't a blame culture. I think we all got together and we've come through the other side now, which has ultimately helped us achieve some, the amount of points we have done. And the characters you've got in the squad, as you say, going up to watch Villa and Imi uh, on Cardiff, I think it's just a nice thing to do. It was a good, nice trip, going to see like different cultures as well. Uh, getting involved with all the Finnish fans was fun. And um, yeah, it was really enjoyable. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that that looked incredible and, uh, you know, maybe not the result that we wanted, no. um, but nice to see that that team bonding as well. But let's talk a bit about the interview you did with BBC Sport about your colitis diagnosis. For those who don't know, it's a kind of swelling or inflammation of the large intestine. And I urge anyone who hasn't seen it already to give it a watch. It was obviously a, a great video that was really informative and would have shown a lot of people what it's like to live with colitis. But w- what's the reaction been to that interview? Yeah, it was massive. Honestly, I when I first decided with my girlfriend, right, I'm going to, I think it was for Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Week, I'm going to put something on my private Instagram just to say, basically, say, look, I've got it. Um, see what the feedback was going to be. And it just so happens one of uh, my friends from school, she now works for the BBC and she said, look, Jack, I think this would be massive to do for like the to go public with it. So I did, and the reception I got back was massive. Like some of the stories I've been sent letters uh, from different people, kids, children, adults, 
grandparents, loads of different people emailing me and uh, basically saying thank you and asking for more information. So I think on the whole, if it helps a few people get diagnosed, not really be scared about going to see the doctors, because I know it is a big thing, especially for men. So I didn't want to do it. I know a lot of other men don't want to do it, but it's one of them things where just be comfortable by being uncomfortable, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess it's a it's a, a problem that affects so many different people and from so many different backgrounds. You know, football's just one part, one aspect of this. But for you to raise awareness of this in your industry, it mu- must be huge. That, I mean, I guess there are other players playing with this who maybe haven't come out and spoken about it as well. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, um, I think it's well documented. Darren Fletcher uh, went through something similar. He had the same kind of thing. And I played with him at West Brom. I knew of it. He had a stomach condition, but it wasn't until I I had a real good conversation with him, just asked him about it, got a bit of information. But yeah, just um, I think Graham Shinney up at Aberdeen come out last week uh, and stating that he has Crohn's just to kind of just get the word out there. Because I do think there is a bit of a stigma that people think if you have this condition, you can, your life's over when it's definitely not and you can still achieve and perform at, the, at a high level uh, with the condition. Yeah, well, exactly that. And I know that you've mentioned that you've uh, taken sort of treatment. I know that there have been certain medicines that you've had to take, which has kind of eased uh, the problems or the, the symptoms that, that come from a problem like colitis. Has that treatment meant that you're you're, you're able to get back into contention to, to playing? Is it, how, how important is that sort of treatment? Being? Yeah, so far, to be fair, the worst of it was in the off season, which was kind of lucky for me. Um and towards the back end of last season. So since I've been at Exeter, it hasn't affected me being able to play or being up for squad selection. Uh, I've been having ongoing treatment, like everyone who has Crohn's and colitis will. um, Go for regular blood tests, uh, stool samples get taken. uh, Normally, every four to six weeks, have a little catch up with the doctors just to see how I am. And honestly, since uh, any time I get a slight hint of... um, the condition coming back to, with the worst uh, symptoms, then I'll just phone the doctor and we'll get put on some stronger medication. So it hasn't really uh, touched wood affected football, especially since I've been at Exeter. And honestly, I'm feeling the fittest that I ever have done. I feel really good in training. I feel ready to, when called upon, um, to go in and uh, go in and play well. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's great to hear. I guess the main thing has been that foot injury that you sustained at Middlesbrough, which is... I suppose, limited your opportunity since coming back from that injury. I, I guess, you know, in recent months, it's been a real test of your resilience to try and fight for a, a space back in that squad. I know that you've made a, the squad a couple of times, um, but it is a, that mental resilience to try and get back in once again. Listen, yeah, it's massive. Obviously, I've come back and we were just coming out of the bad run and we've gone on and the team's picked up. Individuals in my position have played quite well. They've created relationships and it's always going to be hard as a centre-half to get back in. Um, but I've been having real good chats with the gaffer. Uh, I probably call myself one of the leaders in the group with the way I train and the way I talk to people. Um, got to try and keep your standards high, uh, encourage people, be there, be a good teammate. I think it's really important. And then ultimately, if you're training well and you're preparing well, as if you are going to play, then it'll only stand you in good stead for when you do get chucked in. Um, so nothing surprises you. I suppose with a few players who who maybe wouldn't make the the match day squad, maybe not at Exeter City, but you can sometimes get a bit of disruption from these kind of players. I guess that that's totally not you, right? Yeah, no, I think it's ne- it's not in my DNA. I think if you spoke to all the other boys, they'd probably call me busy or something. But <laughs> now, honestly, we've got a, a real good group, and obviously, it's frustrating not being in the team. I'm obviously not going to hide the fact that I have been. You do get angry, you do get frustrated, and it isn't it is a bit annoying, but you've only just you've just got to work hard, be ready for when your chance comes and ultimately you've got to take it. But in terms of the group, I think there's because we've got such a big squad now, we went from having hardly any players to having six or seven boys miss out, but everyone's in the dressing room before the game, uh, at home games, everyone's there uh, cheering each other on, um, encouraging our teammates because uh, we want to do well for the football club and finish as high as we can. Um, I guess one of those opportunities may well come on Friday. Um, I know Zach Jules obviously suspended after that incident in the tunnel uh, last time out against Burton. 
that gives a, you a little bit of an opportunity, doesn't it, to get back into the squad, even if it's only just on the bench. You must have been working extra hard in training to tr- to try and prove to the gaffer that you can get back into that squad. Yeah, that's it. Obviously, I, I can only do what I can do. I've, as I say, I've been having uh, real good chats with the gaffer. Um, I feel ultimately it's down to him to pick the team. And I feel like I've been training really well, along with uh, other players that haven't been making squads. So, yeah, I'm ready, I'm fit, I'm available. Um, whether I make the bench or whether I get in the starting 11 I'll, uh, or whether I'm in the stands, I'll be cheering on the boys anyway. Yeah, and that's exactly what you've got to do. I guess, though, watching from the sidelines has been made that little bit easier in recent weeks because of the on-field performances from the boys who are absolutely smashing it in the last few games. Yeah, it's massive. Obviously, we went through that real bad run, but we knew that the performances uh, sometimes weren't there, but sometimes it was. It's been evident in training that the performances and the the team understanding of what the gaffer wants has been improving uh, week upon week. And now we've got real clarity on what we're doing. Um, We are training really hard, putting the the tactics into fruition on Saturday. And some of the football we've been playing is really, really good. And it's coincided with us picking up points as well. Um, I suppose moving on to Friday then, a great opportunity against Charlton. They're in good form, in fairness, eight games unbeaten now. Yes, they maybe haven't had the season that they would have liked. I guess it makes preparing for the game a bit of an interesting one because their league position doesn't really reflect their recent form and vice versa. So how have you prepared for, for this game compared to others, I guess? I think pretty much how we have done every every team that we play against. We've identified their strengths and their weaknesses with we start, we've come into training on Monday and since Monday we've been preparing what we're going to do, our game plan and uh, putting it into fruition. Obviously, they had a, a new manager, Nathan Jones, go in and they've had a little bounce and they're doing really well. They've got some real good players. Obviously, Alfie, Alfie May scored so many goals, so um, we're going to have to look out for him. But yeah, we're expecting a real good Charlton side to come to us, but we're at home. We're in, on a good run ourselves and we're looking to get three points. Yeah, and what looks like it could be a sellout as well. So expecting a good atmosphere at the park, which always gives you a boost, I guess. Yeah, definitely. When you've got the fans on side and it's kind of like the 12th man, when you're building up pressure as well, especially with the big bank behind. We want to have a lot more moments like we did on the last home game. So uh, more wins on the board. We've got seven games now to get maximum points. So uh, we just want to finish as high as possible and the fans are going to be like massive for us in that. Yeah, that's the aim. Jack, thank you so much for joining me on Park Life this week. It's been great to hear all of your your insight, especially on um, your colitis diagnosis and, and how you've managed to work your way through that and the reception that it's got. So thank you so much for joining me, Jack. No worries. Thank you very much. Next, Joe Pullifoot from Charlton Live drops in to give us the lowdown on Friday's opposition. Joe, welcome to Park Life. Thanks for joining us. At the start of the season, I think a lot of fans had predicted Charlton to do pretty well this year. Some had you in the playoffs, and to be honest, that didn't feel like much of a stretch at the time. As it's turned out, though, this has been a really tough season for the Addicts. What's it felt like from a fan's perspective? uh long it's felt like a very very long season um i i i was on that train i i thought that the promotion was was a real possibility and top six was an absolute minimum this is and i still think it is probably one of the league, weakest league one sort of t- tables and, and groupings that we've we've probably ever had um so to be where we are is a, is a bit of a shocking indictment of um of a few different characters but but particularly Michael Appleton um, and his tenure at the club, which was uh, truly horrific. So, yeah, we're we're really pleased it's petering out now um, into the summer. We can rebuild, wipe the last sort of 12 months from our memory um, of what seemed like a promising summer and then a disappointing winter and and go again with um, with hopefully new hope eternal with uh, Nathan Jones at the helm. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit of a recent luxury to be able to say, you know, forget about the last 12 months. Because if you go back a, a month or, or two ago, it looked like relegation was a genuine possibility. And I think a, fa- a lot of fans would have said, you know, Charlton, big club, surely they won't go down. But we've seen it happen before where big clubs have, have dropped down to the fourth tier. Were, were you genuinely worried about that? Um, so I've actually had the opposite roller coaster to um, the rest of the guys on Charlton Live. Um, so before... Christmas when Appleton was in charge I was very much of the opinion if we didn't get him out before the end of the year 
that we were going to be relegated. There was no coming back if we left Appleton in charge uh, because I didn't see out there a manager that would come in and take us on as, as w- what I felt we were at the time, pretty much a basket case. Um, and we went 17 games. It might have been 18 league games without a win. If we hadn't won when we won, we were a week away from having had the same gap between wins between last season and this season as we had during this season. Wow. So it was it was pretty bleak at that time. But as soon as Appleton came in, you know, we lost immediately 2-0 to Reading and everyone was going, well, you know, the new manager was still losing in these crunch games. And I, I just felt like, you know, if we finally have a manager who for the first time in my lifetime we've hired from above our above our level. So um we were going to go on a good journey with him is is how I genuinely felt. And and he's known to us the missteps at Southampton and Stoke, I pretty much am happy to write off because I think we're more of a Luton than we are a Stoke or a Southampton. So uh, as soon as he was in, I was pretty confident we, we were going to have enough to stay up and the qualities in that squad. I think what Nathan Jones has done is shown just how badly Appleton did with this this squad and the actual calibre of manager that, that he is, as opposed to the, the calibre of the people that we had on the pitch. Yeah, and you mentioned that you. I suppose you you went looking above what Charlton would normally be able to get in terms of Nathan Jones. I mean, a lot of our listeners will remember him from his time in the Premier League with Southampton. Obviously, before that with Luton as well. He was a really highly rated coach when he took the Southampton job, but his time with the Saints did seem to take a real hit to his reputation. I suppose were you surprised to see him take that job, considering you know the position that you were in? No. Um, I was impressed that we spent the money we needed to spend to get him in. That was the bit I was I was impressed by. But he he had been at Charlton previously as a as a youth coach. Um, we would actually brought him in and, and given him basically his a bit of a start and a bit of a leg up before he then went on, I believe, to Brighton. Um, he achieved great things at Charlton, um, even though he was only here, I think, eighteen months. He, he had a really high standing reputation still the head of the academy in those days is still there. So he's still got Steve Avery to work with. He knows that the fan base have clamoured for him to come back on a number of occasions. So he was going to have that that connection with the fans. And he said himself um, in, in a number of interviews that he needs a club where everyone will buy into him. It's his way or the highway. That, that, that's how he is as a, as a coach. So for him, it's about finding the right opportunity. I think we actually presented the right type of club, the right type of fan base and the, the right type of um, challenge to, to coax him back in. I still think it's a massive coup. Um, and I think yeah, a lot of fans potentially on your side will think how arrogant of me to think a Premier League manager would then step in at League One. But he's not the only Premier League manager now down in League One. I think there's about half a dozen of them almost now. So um, I, I don't think that it is necessarily the, the transition down and, and Charlton have a good ownership in terms of financial backing that we've spent money kind of commentary cost over a million it's total package in, in January so if you're going to come to a league one club I think we were a good option for him back you know as, as well having the history it does definitely help well yeah you've certainly got the resources I think that that's that's probably fair to say some good players in your team of course you look up up front at Alfie May and, and Ladapo and we'll come on to May in a little bit um, but since Nathan Jones has taken over eight games unbeaten now I know that only three of them were wins but he seems to have completely turned your season around I, I guess that you're only looking forwards in terms of that momentum now yeah and I think that so you say only three are wins I think that we probably on balance, deserve more than than the three. Um, and in that, we've played uh, Bolton, Derby and Portsmouth, one straight after the other. So that was always going to be a challenge for any club that was in the runner form that we had been in. So uh, I think that, yeah, you're. We, I'm disappointed with the points that we've actually picked up. I, I feel like on, on balance, we probably deserved a little bit more. But the, the rest of this season is now just about seeing what he can get out of this squad, giving him the time to, to pick apart with his weaknesses, his strengths and, and other options. And even in the last couple of weeks, we've signed um, Loire Loire and uh, we signed Conor Wickham as well. So he's still bringing in the elements of the squad that he thinks he needs. So there's definitely some players with points to prove, contracts to fight for. And I don't think he's going to let them take the, the pedal off the gas. But as I say, 
I said it on John Live a few weeks ago. I'm really excited to watch this season peter out and then worry about next year. <laughs> Let's move on to Saturday. Oh, sorry. Let's move on to Friday then, of course. <laughs> Good Friday game. Saturday's in my head, you know. Um, you, two... You've already written Friday off. <laughs> <laughs> um, two clubs that are adjacent in the table, split by just two points. Um, I guess you're expecting quite a close game. I know that I am. Um I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that form-wise, we've been pretty good. So um, I'm thinking it's going to be a game of the team that takes their chances. It's just whether we can stop the silly mistakes and prevent you from, from having too many opportunities. But yeah, I don't expect I don't expect either side to run away with it 3 or 4-0. Um, but it all depends on what wins out. Is it the physicality or, and, and the, the new uh, sort of, oomph that we've got or, or is it the know-how and the sort of longer term relationships that, that potentially you've got in there uh, but I do know that it probably won't be the the, the, the result earlier in the season definitely is misleading because uh, after that sending off it, it was it was pretty much writing on the wall um, and you did have some good opportunities before then as well so we, we were a bit lucky to only be one nil down when we got our equaliser so if you take that then um, yeah I'm certainly not expecting that kind of scoreline again unless somebody else fancies getting sent off for you guys which no, we're more than happy to take. <laughs> um, I guess if there's one man who's going to make the difference once again, then it's surely Alfie May. Of course, in the reverse fixture, he scored two of his 21 for the season. He's been absolutely exceptional this year. Yeah, he's sort of epitomises everything, I think, about Nathan Jones' st- style. He's um, tenacious. He takes his chances when he gets them. And he's a very streaky striker. He says it himself. So he's in a bit of a run of form at the minute in terms of picking up goals. So hopefully he can continue that on Saturday. Uh, but you'll do well to keep him shut. And we've got now four good striking options. So even if he is quiet, luckily we've got some other guys that we can we can call on. Whereas for a long time this season, it's been on his shoulders only. Um, and he's still carried that team through. So are you feeling confident for Friday? I am feeling confident for, for Friday as well, having had uh, you know the the international game off. Um, that that definitely helps, and you know Nathan Jones hasn't had a lot of weeks to to spend on the training ground. He's had a, a long period to to invest in those players and get them uh, playing in the way that he wants. So I'd be expecting a step on again in in performance, uh, and I'm I'm really looking forward to both the the Friday game and and Monday at home for us um, different challenges you know with yourselves and and Stevenage uh, I'm hoping that that it just isn't one of those where it's mid table and no one can really be bothered and <laughs> you just sat at the end going oh it's nil nil and why do we bother turning up but I'm I'm sure with the the management that we've got that that won't be uh, how we're approaching that game so it should be a should be a good fun competitive uh, Friday. Yeah, well, let's hope so. I'm certainly expecting a battle. I'm really looking forward to it. Joe, thank you so much for coming on Park Life uh, this week and uh, best of luck for the rest of the season. And you after Friday. <laughs> Finally, we're back with Alan Tong as he talks to us about his newly released book, From Red to Red. Alan, welcome back. Most City fans will probably know you from your commentaries on BBC Radio Devon. When City play anywhere north of Birmingham, it seems, you're the man who gets the call up. Um, What a lot of people might not know is the story of your journey from professional footballer to academic. So I I guess my first question is, what was it that inspired you to write about your journey and, and document it in the form of a book? Yeah, it's, I think it's something that, that I've always wanted to do for a while. Um, I think I think that I read somewhere there was a quote that everybody's got a book in them <laughs> in somewhere. <laughs> but you know, if you can reflect on different things, so yeah, I, I'm I'm lucky, Tom, in the in the respect that I'm a member of the you know, Man United X Players Association because I signed a professional contract there. So I, I was at um, a dinner a year or two ago, and I sat with a table next to this gentleman who was just asking me about. Uh, who I am and what my background story is and things like that. And I told him about, you know, United and going to Exeter and having to come out of the game through injury and obviously retraining a little bit and managing to get a PhD. And and he went, looked me in the eyes and said, you should write a book about this. I thought, well, well, maybe. maybe. So I, I contacted a, a lad called Michael Garvey. He wrote a book um, about a, an ex-United, an Everton Premier League player called John O'Kane. And um, and I said, like, do you think there's enough here? I give a reflect on a few stories and uh, my journey. And he, he said, yeah, I, th- I think so. You know, there might be something that we can put together. And um, for the last two years, we were kind of meeting in coffee shops and just going over 
uh, different stages of my journey as an apprentice and a young pro and having to come down to Exeter and having to leave the game early and then the kind of the retraining after that. So so I think it's been a bit of a, a cathartic experience, really. I, I've been surprised, Tom, how, how much I've been able to recall. And you know, some things are still quite vivid, like playing in the Devon Derby and you know, playing against teams like Stoke City and Reading away. You know, that, that was the day for, for some of the listeners who remember a lad called Scott Hiley, who was a, a brilliant fullback for Exeter. He got a hat trick on that day, uh, left foot, right foot, and header. So, you know, just recalling those sort of some of those memories. And, you know, so, so yeah, I, th- I think a story really of um, a few ups in there and a few great experiences, but of some really, really lows and some bad downs as well. Yeah, I suppose it's a it's a bit of a mixed bag, but it makes for a great story. Um, I want to go a little bit into, I suppose, each kind of chapter of, of your journey. Um, you started off at 14 years old, signed by Manchester United. It must have been a brilliant feeling becoming Sir Alex Ferguson's first ever acquisition at the club, which is, you know, only one man can say that. For whatever reason, though, it didn't quite work out. United, you kind of fell down the football pyramid, ended up in non-league for a little bit. That must have been quite the awakening and quite the journey from right at the top to, to I suppose, falling down and, and, and having to rebuild yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. And, you know, you talk about this sort of thing in like destiny sort of thing, you know, it's that's like life doesn't go in a straight line. It goes from side to side, up and down and backwards and forwards. And, you know, I think things were going okay at United. I was uh, I played in an under 18 team at 15. I played in the reserves, at, which was a good level back then at 16 years old. Um, so Alex took me to with the first team to play in a friendly at 17. So but the early formative years were going quite well. And then I think it's difficult because uh, competition and, you know, lots of really good players. And I kind of started leveling off a little bit. And um, I think United had a few good seasons, but I think you have to have more than good seasons. You have to be like precocious or standing out to get an opportunity, and you know, and that that's the thing, Tom, in football. If your opportunity doesn't arrive and, and doesn't come, that's just the way it goes, and you know, you have to kind of accept that with grace and, and look to maybe do something else. And you know, I kind of went on a bit of a journey then, from sort of as you say, dropped into the non-league for a little spell, and then. Uh, got the call like from Exeter that they'd have a look at us. So I went down on trial and um, you know managed to impress Alan Ball, who was the manager at the time. And uh, I stayed at Exeter, yeah, for a, for a, f- a few seasons. Like I managed to sign a couple of professional contracts with with the club, and and um, yeah, got to I think it was about 1994, so around 22 years old. And unfortunately, I had a, another blow where uh, uh, suffered a, sadly a, a, re- a really bad injury. Yeah, well, exactly. And I was going to move on to that. Injuries kind of took their toll. I think it was a back injury, wasn't it? Which really uh, forced you out of the game, I guess. At that time, I guess you've got to be looking at other career options and and really got to consider your future in life beyond professional football. And that must have been particularly difficult considering a lot of your time at school was taken up by football. So maybe did you have that educational background to fall back on how did you manage to get back in and, and retrain yeah it was it was a tough one really because you know in, in the modern day Tom as we know football clubs now loads of player care departments and people who manage the education for you and you know look out for you but back then you know very in its infancy there was nothing so uh, I remember I got a phone call I think from Exeter and said like you check from the football leagues in the we had a club shop called the near post it's it, it's in a safe there, so you've got to go get that. And it, it, honestly, Tom, it, it wasn't. I think I mentioned it in the book, but it wasn't a lot of money, really. So, and I had United put me through a bit of education. I went to a college to uh, one day a week just to get a B Tech. So, that, but that's all I had coming out of football. So it's like I've been a footballer now to tw- about twenty three and a half. What do I do next? And it was a, a huge decision. And and uh, you know, for that spell, that uh, you know, I, I got a bit lost. Really, I'd have not bit directionless and um I think I think the shock of having to sort of retire young was like a bit too much at the time and um I wouldn't say I I went into a full depression but definitely aspects of it and and just I think my time was just not being spent constructively for a spell. Um ended up in you know pubs too much and you know gambling a bit and I've started to put weight on so you know not great to be fair. So I think it was a family member. I think I got to about 27, 28 years old and they said, 
have you not fancy reinvesting in your education, really, or going back to uni? And I, I never really thought about that at the time because university, to me, Tom, was like mad physics teachers with complex equations on the board. <laughs> and I never saw myself fitting in there. But it was in the days where kind of like sports science was just t- starting to creep in. I thought, well, if, if I kind of did a degree and I managed to get that qualification, I might get an, find myself with another job in sport then. So... So yeah, I went on a bit of an educational journey. So I think I think in the book, Tom, I think I titled it like the, the first half up to about 25 was my football. And then second half was kind of my education. And and as you say, I, you know, I've, I've managed to pick up a degree. I've done a teacher training qualification, a PGCE, uh, picked up a master's degree in philosophy and then got a PhD as well. So yeah, I've been on a bit of an educational journey and, and, and been teaching now for 20 years. It's absolutely fascinating. I, I suppose a lot of ex-footballers if they don't or you know footballers who who don't quite you manage to extend their career in the professional game a lot of those players fall out of the game and move maybe into a trade I was speaking to Richard Logan who uh, a few weeks ago who says that he's doing sort of alloy wheels on cars at the moment that's not something that you chose to do what exactly was it that convinced you to go back into education rather than pick up a trade like a lot of ex-pros do yeah, and I think I think the first thing, Tom, I think, you know, Eamon Dolan, bless him, an ex-manager of, of Exeter, he, he got me a few hours in coaching in the community, um, but which was fantastic. But unfortunately, it was just seasonal. So it was just like half terms and Easter and Christmas. And, and it wasn't really regular enough, you know. And But he, he, he tried to look out for me, Eamon. And, you know, he, I'll never forget that. It's fantastic. Um, but after that, it's kind of like, well you've almost like got this decision to make, what what do you do next? I, I say it to a lot of 18-year-olds when they come to do degrees at, uh, at the place of where I work at the moment, UCFB, and I say, well, what is it you want to do? And I think it's such a difficult question. And um, so, yeah, I just went on a bit of a journey. I think so I, I really enjoyed some of the lectures when I went on my um, on my university course. And I, I think it got to a stage where I thought, you know, I, I could maybe see myself doing that. And I kind of sort of like thought, yeah, you know, I'll retrain in that area, and you know, let, let's see see where that journey takes you. And you know, just just going back to football, I, I would have loved to stay in football, but the the opportunities going back into the early nineties were quite low, Tom, because you kind of had the first team manager, uh, resi team manager, maybe youth team manager, and it, it, coming out of the game so young, I, I felt as though I didn't really have the credibility to, you know, to go into that like from an opportunity perspective. So. So I thought, well, let, let, let's make a clean break and let's kind of go in another direction. And, you know, I think that going back to university, I think that one of was the best decisions I ever made. And and I've managed just to just to secure my path a little bit since since I did that. Yeah, you speak a lot about other sort of young players who are making their way in professional football. But we know the realities of being a, a young pro. It doesn't always turn into a professional career. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts, really, on education for professional sports people. Now, footballers in particular, and I know it's very different in sports like rugby, um, but footballers, they tend to go straight from school into professional football, leaving no time for A-levels, let alone a university degree. Agree. Do you think the balance is right between football and education for young people at the moment? I, th- I think it's getting better. You know, I'm sure Exeter now they put all the young scholars through you know different pathways because, as you say, so I think the d- the data tells you how difficult it is. You know, um, I think it, the pre- if you're playing in the Premier League, like no point, no one two percent of all players, you know, it'll get to make a debut or, or play Premier League football. I think it goes to less than 1% in professional football at any level. So the, the data is quite damning, really. So, um, and the trouble that we find, I think, a lot of the a lot of the players from my area is you always got like this, almost like this real strong athletic identity around football, as though football is the be all and end all. And, you know, and I think I think your point there about education and doing different things and you know, developing almost into a, a broader, richer identity, I think is 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 important because you're so true, Tom. The game can throw up so much injuries, uh, in and out the team, you know, deselection, the manager in leaving you out one week, playing the next, and it really is a roller coaster ride. It, it's such a unique industry, football. Very parallel, a lot of parallels with the, the military. You know, it's a very unique culture, professional football, and you know, and, and things can quickly change, unfortunately. So, um, you know, like anybody else, Tom, everybody has different journeys in it. People get full careers. 
people get to maybe 24, 25 and have to drop down a league or two. People will be out of the game young. So it's just trying to be, it's just trying to make yourself ready for that next step, isn't it? You know, most people will want to stay in the game in some capacity. But unfortunately, a large percentage are going to have to look for something else to do. And, you know, that's that's the key for all stakeholders, the PFA, the clubs, making sure that players are ready for that next step in, instead of getting a shock to the system where you're not ready. Well, yeah, exactly that. And I suppose when you're looking at the stars, you know, professional career, maybe in the Premier League, even in the Football League, that can be such a a goal to get to, a huge goal and, and one that pays huge dividends, but it doesn't work out for everybody. And for those who have been chasing a dream for it to all come crashing down, that can create some really difficult mental health problems. And I know that this is something that you're really passionate about. You've done a lot of work with Manchester Mind, who I know the percentage of the royalties from the book um, will be going to, of course. Uh, it's, a, it's a real problem in football right now, especially for those players who get released from professional clubs at a young age. What more do you think does need to be done to support those young players experiencing depression and anxiety after leaving the game? I think it's just for me. It's all about it's all about safe spaces to talk, and you know, not. It's about it's about trying to open up a little bit around your feelings, and you know, we're, we're human beings at the end of the day, and you know, football. The ups and downs are incredible. It's one of them unique trades where, you know, you get you get you can be on so high one minute winning matches, and then the next game you're crashing down, you get beat. You know, you know, it's it's really random and. And I think I think the thing for me on it is is just getting the right support in there around players who have issues, who can speak to somebody in confidentiality around anything that they feel as though is not quite right at the moment. Um, you know, footballers in in my era tended to go to the pub or the bookies. That was almost a release. But you know, when you look back at that, so you think that's the worst thing you should be doing. And it's just just the pressures I think around you. And you know, I, I would kind of. Um, a Bolton lad. I was from Manchester, Greater Manchester. I had to come a long way to Exeter at 19 and a half. And, you know, and like a lot of degree students, you've got to grow up sooner or later. But you're away from family. And, you know, and you look at that and you think, you know, it, when when you look back, it's, it's probably quite a tough experience. But I, ju- I just felt as though I had a little bit more to give. And in, in, in relation to professional football, I had a bit of a, you know, a difficult experience at United. And I just felt I had a little bit more, which, you know, I was lucky I realising ambition by playing in the Football League, scoring in the Football League. And, you know, that that was brilliant. But, you know, foot, football is unforgiving at times. And one thing I think it does do as well, Tom, is you get quickly forgotten football. It doesn't... It, it leaves you behind sharpish. So, so, yeah, I think best advice for any young players is just to keep up with your education and, you know, make sure that you have other options, you know, uh, whatever that may be, whatever your interest. I know a lot going to like clothing branding now or, or learning to DJ or you learning to play a musical instrument, a- anything that can shape a broad, broader components to your identity. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've only really managed to touch the sides here, Alan, but there's so much uh, that you know, I, mean, I suppose you could read more about in your book. So just to remind our listeners where they can get your hands uh, on uh, from red to red. Yeah, so it, probably main place like Amazon. It's in Waterstones. <laughs> yeah, the usual stuff. W H Smiths, and I believe Tom. I don't know if it's happened yet. There's supposed to be coming some coming into the club shop. I believe so. Oh, there we go. If, if, that good? There, if, if, if anybody's interested, of course. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Alan, thank you so much for both previewing the game earlier and, of course, talking about your book. Uh, and best of luck uh, with the with with the the sales. I guess it's it's a great <laughs> one. Uh, so uh, yes, do get your hands on on from Red to. Red. Alan, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Tom. That's all for this episode of Park Life, the official Exeter City podcast. Let us know what you want to hear more of via our social media channels and don't forget to hit the follow button so you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening. Up the city. He's been picked out. Socks down to his ankle. Picked out Stansville. That's the hat trick. And that's what dreams of